Welcome back to Chips and Salsa, where we talk security at Intel. I'm Jerry. I'm Crow. Hey, Crow. We got a special yeah. guest today, uh, Daniel Mohimi, uh, who has uh, a couple of talks coming up here. One uh, tomorrow, Black Hat, and another uh, Friday at the USENIX conference hmm. uh, to talk about his paper called Downfall, uh, which is an issue he reported to us uh, at Intel and uh, is being addressed in today's security advisories by Intel SA00828. Well, great. Let's get talking to Daniel. Let's talk to Daniel. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Could you maybe take a moment and introduce yourselves to our viewers? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is uh, Daniel Morini. I'm, uh, uh, I'm right now working as a research scientist at Google. Uh, before that, I was doing research at UC San Diego as a postdoctoral scholar. And uh, yeah, I, I, I generally uh, research security of high performance computers and hardware with some focus on cryptography. And uh, yeah, I got into kind of hardware security and this kind of topic during my PhD in 2016, like when I was looking into cache side channel attacks and hardware-based uh, security primitives like Intel software guard extensions. And that's how I got interested in this topic. And uh, and I think it was around like 2019 and 2019 and, and around that time that I did some work on the follow-up of follow-up to meltdown and, and like things like microarchitectural data sampling and load value injection and uh, uh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, you've uh, you're no stranger to us. We've been collaborating with you for several years on your great research. Um, so today we're here to talk about your latest paper, um, which you an issue you found that uh, you're referring to as uh, downfall. You know, we we call it gather data sampling on our end. But uh, can you? Kind of uh, introduce your paper, what and what led you down the path of finding uh, this particular issue. Uh, yeah, so I uh, uh, the the paper is about uh, essentially exploiting the x eighty six gather instruction to leak data from the internal CPU register register file that holds data from sometimes other applications or other security domains that are running on the same CPU core. And having worked on previous vulnerabilities like microarchitectural data sampling, that gave me some intuition that maybe there is a chance that we can execute this instruction and this instruction may leak data from other execution of this instruction. And from that hypothesis, it took me maybe a couple of weeks to have the first uh, proof of concept that shows that this is actually possible across different processes. and and. From there, you know, looked closer at it the next few months and and realizing that the gather can essentially leak data from all sorts of other instructions too. And essentially, uh, we can leak data from the vector or floating point register file inside the uh, CPU. Can you maybe share with us uh, what are some common use cases we might see uh, where we might see gather instructions used? Uh, that, that's an interesting question. So, uh, I mean, this instruction in low level is designed to help optimizing accessing non contiguous data in memory. Uh, and I mentioned cryptography, I mentioned seeing this in cryptography code, but essentially anywhere that we want to have efficient data encoding and decoding, this sort of uh, problem occurs that this could be like some compression algorithm, it could be some encoding algorithm like video encoding, it could be even some AI and machine learning where there is this uh, natural language processing algorithms that they do some like, uh, you know, embedding and encoding and, and that sort of thing. And uh, these are these are ideas, but like concretely, like when I looked into this after finding this vulnerability, I saw this is used in like some graphic and video encoding libraries that's uh, that's in, used in some web browsers and uh, and I can imagine it's it's used across like high performance computing space and and AI and machine learning too. Given 
those parameters, you know, how practical do you think uh, an attack like this would be outside of a controlled lab environment? So in, in, the, in the research paper, I have, I guess, different variants of these. The, and I mean, the name gather data sampling in, in my research paper, I mentioned it as the first variant of downfall attack, which kind of is the same thing. And, and the idea is that the first variant is just, you can use the gather to uh, leak data from other uh, vector operations, memcopy operations and other things. And then there is, there are the other two variants that one of them leaks data uh, that is not necessarily accessed due to some prefetching behavior of um, non-copy operation. And then the third variant called gather value injection, which essentially applies the same idea as the LVI load value injection attack to the gather instruction. Uh, it, among these three variants, the first one, uh, in my opinion, is highly exploitable. Uh, it took me probably like a month from discovering this vulnerability to end up developing an end-to-end -end attack to steal AES keys from uh, from OpenSSL across different VM instances and across different processes. Uh, I, I think one thing to to notice about this attack compared to like previous data sampling attacks is that like previous data sampling attacks, uh, it, we could not leak more than like a couple of bytes at a time. And, uh, and only leaking a couple of bytes at a time plus not having access to the address you're leaking, it makes it much more difficult to extract uh, a lot of information. But here, uh, one special feature of this attack is that you can leak up to like 20 bytes on some architectures and, and four or eight bytes of contiguous data from other processes. And, and even though we don't have direct access, direct access that what address we want to leak, if you leak like eight bytes of chunk of data, there's a higher chance that you can essentially construct secrets like uh, encryption keys because these encryption keys are repeated sometimes and they they're also have a uniform data pattern that, that distinguish themselves from like uh, text that's, that's, you know, that's predictable. And uh, and that's part of it. I, I, I believe it's, it should be even possible, like if people really care about this kind of issue to even develop a meta exploit module or some sort of exploit key to use this kind of attack for penetration testing too. Uh, but it for sure needs more like engineering and time for people to make that attack reliable and make that attack works across different architectures because different architectures, different implementation of uh, the same feature may leak with different data bandwidth and things like that. Now, you had approached Intel um, with your research through a thing we call coordinated vulnerability disclosure, which we really appreciate uh, the opportunity to work with us. And we were able to develop a mitigation. So have you had a chance to test our mitigations yet? Uh, yeah, I, I, I did some tests uh, with the mitigation. And my, I mean, the, the good news is that the mitigation uh, stopped my attack code from leaking anything useful. And uh, I think uh, that that's promising. And I'm sure uh, Intel mm -hmm. also internally has done some tests on that too. Uh, I think uh, it's, uh, this, is, this is important uh, to work with, uh, you know, with vendors like Intel mm -hmm. uh, to, to coordinately fix things and <laughs> improve security posture across the industry. Uh, sure. I guess maybe one concern I have, like going forward in the future, is how people are gonna like take this mitigation and apply it, like in terms of deployment. Uh, whether some people are gonna decide to disable it or or disable it in particular instances or cases, and mm -hmm. and that that sort of things are things that I think that the whole industry will learn more about it, like uh, like in in the next few months, but. I mean, I think one of the challenges is that like, when you have this kind of mitigation, there is always like some performance overhead and, and some workloads are not affected at all. Some workloads may affect it to some degree and people are gonna be playing this game of, oh, should we enable this, should we disable this? And that, that sort of things I think is important. 
uh, I hope going forward, everybody enable this, uh, this mitigation by default. You mentioned uh, HPC environments earlier or high performance compute. Um, we, you know, looking at those types of environments, you know, they don't usually uh, configure themselves in a way that would be, uh, I guess, advantageous for an attack like this. Is that uh, your assessment as well? Uh, it, it could be true or not. I mean, if you have a HPC, let's say, worked out that somebody rent out an entire server, then uh, yeah, this that doesn't apply. This You could even um, disable the mitigation, assuming that that entire server is occupied by one person. But there are all sorts of other players, like even I think in it could be a startup, it could be different companies who are, who are renting out uh, in, instances or machines from different like cloud providers. And, and in those cases, it's a still HPC work, but the, but they still collocate their workload with other other things that are not necessarily dedicated to themselves. And uh, and I, I don't really have the answer for sure to know sure. how how this pans out for them. Yeah, oh, I think it's important for people to review your paper, review the technical information we provide, and kind of make their own decisions on kind of what their risk appetite is and kind of how they view this threat with their particular circumstance. Yeah, and, and to Chrome's point, yeah, we we are also publishing a, a technical paper kind of describing the issue that you found and uh, some of the mitigations. And, you know, uh, we, we have a separate paper on uh, performing a, a threat assessment uh, to help customers understand, you know, what what uh, what are the scenarios under which you know they'd be potentially vulnerable to an issue like this, so that you know they can make their own assessment given their individual environment. So, you know, as we wrap up here, is there anyone you want to acknowledge or thank that helped you uh, assisted you with this research? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, I I think uh, I I like to thank uh, Thomas Eisenberg from University of Lubeck and. And Dan and Stefan from UC San Diego, because uh, at the time when I was working on this research, it wasn't funded by anybody or or mm -hmm. any grant or anything. I was just hacking in my free time. So so they uh, they gave me access to their to their hardwares and servers, so I can access this vulnerability on, on a few different machines. So that was that was really helpful. And also, uh, Dan played a good role of a rubber ducky and. You know, when I was completing the research paper, we had a lot of interesting conversation about different mm -hmm. ideas and and maybe, you know, some fun ideas around like how this could impact web browsers and things like that, uh, that we didn't get to explore, but but it was interesting to see different perspectives around that. Yeah, uh, so yeah, now that you've moved out of academia and uh, working at uh, Google, do you anticipate doing more research like this or are you going to be focused on other things? I mean, uh, I, I mean, you can imagine I'm going to continue researching uh, security of high performance hardware and computers in general. I think uh, like in short term, I mean, and I mean, I have my hands in a few different kind of, I guess, research topics like like before, like maybe some cryptography and and things like that, and uh, and I think related to this particular uh, particular issue, one thing that's interesting research problem for everybody in the industry and academia is how moving forward we can build better test uh, test and verification tools uh, to avoid this kind of issue and. Uh, I don't have really any solution for this problem. Uh, <laughs> like it, it's an open research problem, and I think uh, something I'm interested in. So you're presenting uh, downfall at both at uh, Black Hat 2023 and Usenix. Uh, have you been to either of those conferences? Are you excited to uh, kind of get on the big stage and share your your research with uh, them? Yeah, I think uh, I've been to Usenix Security uh, several times, and I think uh, it's it's one of my favorite uh, academic mm -hmm. conferences. Uh, and uh, but I mean, 
I, I would say I'm more excited to actually go to Black Hat in person because <laughs> last last time I had a talk uh, at Black Hat in 2020, it's ended up uh, being COVID, and yeah. I I presented my my talk virtually. So I've actually never been to Black Hat in person. So that's I think really exciting for me. I had the same experience that year. wasn't quite the same feel talking to a, a box as a room full of folks. Yeah, it was definitely uh, a lot of fun for, well, Krobe, Krobe couldn't attend last year. Uh, so, but uh, it was fun for me to go there and, and do some of these, you know, uh, interviews in person with, with folks. That was, that was a lot of fun. So mm -hmm. yeah. good luck uh, with your talks this year. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's going to be, I think, exciting. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, that, there's going to be like maybe some interesting conversation with other researchers in the, in the you know, oh, yeah. industry and academia. And, and it's always good to get perspective of both, uh, both audience. So I think that's, that's I'm, what I'm really looking forward to. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking your time today to share your research a little bit with us. And we're looking forward to hearing more from you in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Thank you very much. Wow. I, I, Jerry, I, I love talking to all these smart researchers. It's really interesting kind of what motivates them and kind of inspires their areas of research. Yeah. And, you know, as always, you know, we are friends of academics uh, and sponsor and, you know, give grants for a lot of uh, security research. And, you know, so we love to bring them on the show and, and just, you know, pick their brains about what they found and, you know, like you said, what what inspires them to go certain directions? So, good luck to you and your talks, uh, Daniel, and thank you for you know your uh, valued co collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. We really appreciate it because work, but whether it's an intel researcher, a security researcher, or an academic, it all helps the whole ecosystem be better and help people be more secure. That's right. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>